You shouldn't even give them no information. This is illegal. This is illegal search. Don't worry. No, he ain't got to answer no questions. He ain't got to answer no questions. It don't matter. It ain't on though right now. You didn't press the button. I know law, bro. If you ain't committing no crime, you ain't got no business right here asking no question, interrogating them. This is a legal detain. What crime was committed? Who would they say was watching? Who they said that did it? Who are you looking for? What's the person's name? What's the description of the person, officer? Sir. Yes. They ask you to leave the bus? You don't have the right to ask me to leave the bus. <laughs> right, do you have a bus pass? Yes, I do. Let me see it. Anything on you? Weapons, anything like that? No, you don't. I asked the question. Now, listen to me. He's going to tell you to get off the bus. He cannot tell you to get off the bus. I'm going to take you off the bus. I'm with my wife. He cannot tell me what stop to get off. Yes, he can. No, he cannot. Let me see your bus pass. You can come out illegally do anything you want to. Let me see your bus pass. But I will not get off this bus until my stop is right. Keep that camera. Right Your name and band number, sir. Royal 6611. And you are being audio and visually recorded as well. Oh, 13148. You're being audio and video recorded. Okay. Why didn't you show him the speak. pass when he asked to see a pass? Listen, you don't know what happened, okay? Listen, I got on the bus before you he raised your voice to me, you're gonna have a problem. I got freedom of speech, okay? Slow it. You better stop food. No, Listen to me, I'm asking you a question. I'm, I don't answer questions. No, I'm asking you a question. If he asked to see a bus pass, why but didn't you show I just to told him? you again. Why didn't you ask? Why didn't you well, I got on the bus prior to him getting on the bus. I'd already paid my staff, I don't have to answer to him. Good idea on you? I don't need an ID. Yeah, I'm a charge. I'm gonna keep some crime. Let me see your ID. I asked you a question. Right now, I, we are investigating. So I, am, I, am I being detained? Right now, you are. If you're going what, to, what crime am I about so to commit? Let me see this. What crime am I committed or about to commit? Because, per security, you didn't show them a bus pass. That's not a crime. Okay, listen to me. It is if you're going to be on the bus, what on is the, bus pass. What is it, a crime or a misdemeanor? That's a misdemeanor. Okay, then. Then you arrest me for not having a bus pass. <laughs> I've been legally convicted of a crime. Well, you got some ID on me? Why would you need your ID? Because I want to see who you are. That's not how the law works, sir. It and, does. No, that's, and this is not a stop in ID state. Can you tell me what crime I've committed? What crime? Yes. You, you're looking at our patrol car. Is that, is that breaking the law? Or is that just, you don't like and, it? No, I want to know who you are. But, sir, that's not the law. That's a person. Who are you? What, why? That's the, Did you that's ask me who I was earlier? But you have to identify yourself because you're so law enforcement. So do you. No, I don't. Not if yes, I haven't broken do. the law, sir. And you should know that. How long yeah. have you been on this job? A long time. A long time. And you should know that, officer. Yeah, I do. So, you got any idea? No, I don't. You, I you don't. ain't going to tell me who you and are? And I don't consent to any, to any searches or seizures either. Not unless I've committed a crime. And I haven't committed one. And you should know that law, officer. Like, I'm surprised that you've been on this job and you don't know that law. I haven't committed a crime. So you don't understand that we got more miles backers than you got forward. Yeah. And, so and, and you're really, and I'm first, gonna take a step back and really thing, close and y'all have guns. The second thing is, you're not gonna tell us what we're gonna end up doing and not doing. No, I'm just, you're on our property. Yeah. This you're is looking at our property. vehicles. It's yeah. public property so, and my tax dollars pay for this. Sheriff's office property. And this it belongs is public. to the county. So if you wanna take a picture with your phone, you can go out there on that sidewalk. Which is public. Uh, so what you're deep. saying is, tax dollars pay for this, but I'm not allowed to be here. That ain't got nothing to do with it. No, gonna, well, no. Well, that's around, what he just said. Around, yeah, everything we just said. That's what he just said, officer. We said we have a right to investigate because you're on our property. Can I have your name? Officer McNeil. No, McNeely. I can't. Officer McNeil. You're not going to tell me your name. Is that what you would tell the judge? No. My, my name ain't, my name's not is, Officer McNeil. Is that what you would tell the judge? Yeah. Is that what you tell the judge? I, I'm not in any. No, you tell your attorney tell the judge. Yeah. yeah. You tell the attorney tell the judge. So, okay. are y'all trying to intimidate me to tell y'all who I am? No. I haven't broken the law. I'm just finding out who you are. I just want to know who you are. We have a right to find out who you are. But I might just say no. I don't need any more friends, sir. I got a really close family. Why are you here? Because I want to take pictures in family. Because it's my uh, constitutionally protected right of anything I can see. So why don't you go over there and take pictures? Because I want to be over here. Well, exactly. Uh, I don't want you to be here. You don't have to go But see, but then that's a personal request. That's a personal. It's not lawful. I haven't broken the law. You and have this, no right to be here. How it's not? like It's like me going to a call that I have no right to go to. Yeah. 
say it works both so, ways. You just can't have your cake and eat it too. This isn't my cake. This is, I, I can this be This is you here. wanting to do what you want to do. Is what this is. But if I haven't broken a law, what's wrong with that? Okay, so I can go I can go do whatever I want to do. If you haven't broken a law, you're free to go do whatever you want to do. And you should know that. Y'all should know that. If I I'm mean, not breaking a law, you should know that. You what hassle am I giving y'all? You should know you should be able to identify yourself to law enforcement. If I've broken the law, you can't just it walk don't up there. matter if you broke the law yes, or not, man. you making stuff up as you go, man. What's the stop and identify statute here? What's the stop and identify? Yes, yeah. this isn't a stop and identify state. Cassie, who's in charge here? Who's in charge here? Who has higher man. rank? Your supervisor. Yeah. Cash your question. No. Are you? Yo, what? Well, I'm going to. Are you detaining me? No. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. What is the law? Where did it come from? How do you use it? And the most important question of all: What can it do for you? If you're a melanated person in America or anywhere in the world for that matter. These questions have haunted your family and communities from the beginning of slavery all the way to the present day due to the fact that most of us were and are unable or unwilling to find the answers. Answers the ruling elite not only pray never come to light for the poor and underclass, which are largely comprised of highly melanated people, but answers they work plot and scheme tirelessly to hide from you like a Jehovah's Witness at your front door. Why do they do this? Because among other obvious reasons, they know that the laws in a political society are equivalent to the rules of a game. And if you know the rules to the game, it puts you on an even playing field with all of the players. An example of this would be tic-tac-toe. The goal is to get three of the same kind in a row for the win. The rule is your opponent can block you in your attempt to achieving this goal. However, if you do not know that rule, you can never win this game because your opponent will block you every time without you making any attempt to block them unless you quickly pick up on that rule. Another good example would be the board game Monopoly, which actually has many rules. The goal is to earn all of your opponent's money and property on the board to win the game. You do this by utilizing all of the rules of the game to your advantage, like buying all of the properties of the same color, then being able to double the rent to bankrupt your opponent, hence a monopoly. Just as knowing the rules or instructions to any game allows you to create a strategy or plan to take advantage of that game, knowing the laws of any civil society in which you live allows you to take advantage of that society. Most casinos in Las Vegas, and around the world to a large extent, all have very similar games to hijack your money with, from poker to roulette to slot machines. But the house rules on how to play those games in order to win will vary depending on which casino you're in. And whichever casino or house you go to, you must learn their rules in order to give yourself the greatest chance of winning their games. And in this way, you can look at your country, state, county, or city as the house casinos whose rules, at least the very basic ones you need to move around, you must learn to give yourself and your family the best possible chance of succeeding in their game called law, government, and politics. But why? And why is everything in the world run by this thing called law? Why is law a part of every civil society in the world? And back to our original question, what is law? Well, the dictionary, both legal and everyday editions, define the word law as coming from the Latin lex, which means that which is laid down, meaning something fixed or set as in a foundation of a house or the roots of a tree. But where did this idea of the law or laying down fixed and set principles and rules to live by come from? Now, before we can answer that question, I think it first must be understood that there are two types of law universal or natural law, and man-made law. Universal or natural laws are fixed and immutable principles or rules to which nature adheres for the creation of life and matter. The ancient Kemetan, who you may know as the Egyptian Thoth or Tehuti, wrote a book on these universal laws or principles called the Emerald Tablets, with the seven most important of these laws being compiled in a book called the Kabbalion. A few examples of these laws would be 1. The law of mentalism. The universe is mental and in your mind, meaning that everything we see in existence came from a thought, 
whether from the mind of man or the mind of God, which means, in essence, you create your own reality. And incidentally, the word thought came from the ancient Kemetan Thoth, the god of wisdom, mathematics, knowledge, science, and writing. Number two, the law of polarity. Everything has poles and every pole has its opposite. Opposites are identical in nature, but different in degree. Extremes meet, left and right, up and down, in and out. Even Thoth had his feminine polar opposite, Ma'at, the goddess of truth, justice, order, harmony, and law. Three, the law of vibration. Nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. This law is referring to the fact that all matter is made up of molecules that vibrate whether we can see them or not. Even something that looks as inanimate as a rock or table is still vibrating or moving, just very, very slowly. For the law of cause and effect. Every cause has its effect and every effect has its cause. This law refers to the scientific fact that everything that happens in the world has its cause or point of origin and every action will have a specific and measured result. Nothing happens randomly or by chance. This law can be seen in the simple phrase, whatever you do will come back on you, or do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Some Buddhists say it in the chant, nam myoho renge or simply stated, cause and effect. For the other three universal principles, please go and read the Kabbalion by the three initiates. Master these principles and earn the keys to the mastery of life. And so with the ancients being supreme observers of nature, or netter, which is where the word nature actually comes from, and the word netter or neteru being the name of the Kemetan gods collectively, which ironically were just different attributes or laws of nature. And the ancestors, seeing this divine law in order to work in perfect harmony through nature, decided that humans, being a part of nature themselves, should adhere to similar laws and principles to create the same order and harmony within humans. The first collection of these man-made laws can be seen in the ancient civilization of Sumer, today's Iraq, in the document called the Code of Ur-Namu. The ancient Sumerians, who called themselves the Sagiga, meaning the dark-headed ones, were until recently known to be the oldest civilization on earth and are the creators of the first writing style called cuneiform. The Code of Urnamu written in cuneiform is a set of laws dealing with the determination of noblemen, commoners, and their wives and slaves. Most of the penalty for the violation of these laws were monetary in nature, meaning you had to pay a hefty fine as with the violation of most laws today, with only a few requiring the ultimate price of death. Examples of some of these laws would be if a man commits a murder, that man must be killed. If a man commits a robbery, he will be killed. If a man commits a kidnapping, he is to be imprisoned and pay 15 shekels of silver. If a man marries a slave and that slave is set free, he does not leave the household. If a slave marries a native, meaning a free person, he or she is to hand the firstborn son over to his owner. If a man violates the rights of another and deflowers the virgin wife of a young man, they shall kill that male. If a slave escapes from the city limits and someone returns him, the owner shall pay two shekels to the one who returned him. If a man knocks out the eye of another man, he shall weigh out a half a mina of silver. If a man divorces his first time wife, he shall pay her one mina of silver. Ancient alimony, people. Now, as you can see, monetary compensation for doing harm to a person was a major part, if not motivating factor of the law, as well as the behavior and requirements of slaves. Then came the laws of Eshnuna. They again were laws that dealt with social stratification and the requirements that came along with those class distinctions or statuses. And as was the case with the Code of Urnamu, offenses against these laws were punishable by fines with the same serious crimes like murder or robbery being punishable by death. After that comes the Code of Hammurabi, which is the most well-known ancient law of all and still in use in some places today. These 282 laws were far more expansive than the previous law codes, but dealt with much of the same subject matter, with violations or offenses being graded mostly on social stratification, also known as class status. 
the punishment for these code violations became much more violent, with the harsher punishments being handed out to the lower enslaved classes. The Hammurabi Code is where you get the doctrine of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And no, it did not come from the Bible. There are great similarities with the ancient law systems and the ones present today. Those with higher status and wealth were able to bypass the penalties of many of these laws, mostly because the upper class and nobles were the ones holding office and writing these laws. Actually, they made up the majority of those who could read and write. As populations grew and became more dense and compacted, the need for more laws to maintain peace and order became a prevalent necessity. Many civilizations and empires adopted these law code systems, not only to maintain order, but also to oppress and control the lower and slave class people. Because most of those with a lower class status could not read or write, they weren't even able to take advantage of the very few laws that did exist to protect them outside of being someone's property or indebted to another. The early Roman system of law was based on the Etruscan religion itself highly influenced by Greek and Phoenician mythology, and dealt with class status as well. The patricians being the upper class, the plebeians being the middle and lower class, then the slave. Roman slaves differed much from other slaves in that they were highly educated. Many of them were doctors, teachers, skilled craftsmen, and adepts of Roman law, being that Rome had colonized so many different lands. The 17th century French sociologist Marcel Mot states, in Roman times, the persona or public status gradually became synonymous with the individual, but the slave was excluded from it. Service non habit personam. A slave has no persona. He has no personality. However, with many of the Roman slaves being educated and versed in these laws, they were able to save their money and purchase their freedom from their owners and eventually became citizens with full rights to vote. And their status changed from slave to liberty, the legal term for a freed slave. But they were still second-class citizens and could not hold office or any government positions. From Rome, as well as many other empires and civilizations, like with the British and the 1215 Magna Carta, these law systems kept evolving, eventually finding their way to the New World along with the European colonizers. Early English colonies established ordinances or laws for the colonists to live by, which individually each colonist had a hand in enforcing, being that there were no police forces in existence back then. The Puritans had strict laws against the colonists, considering lying, idleness, drunkenness, various sexual offenses, and just general bad behavior as a crime. Some of these colonial laws dealt with what to do about raids from the surrounding aboriginal tribes and nations whom the colonists labeled uncivilized savages. However, these savages had been operating their own governments with their own systems of law for hundreds of years before the colonists arrived. When the ships of the old world first hit land to colonize the new, two thirds of the immigrants arriving from Europe were indentured servants, given passage to the new world in exchange for contractual servitude till they could work it off for the agreed amount of years. However, being that many of these new immigrants were illiterate, let alone knew nothing about the law, they were unable to comprehend the full terms of their contract and were tricked or forced into serving longer terms or until they died under contractual servitude. The first Africans arriving to America in 1619 arrived as indentured servants, as there were no laws for permanent slavery within the colonies. And they were treated equally with Caucasian indentured servants. Given the ability to serve out the terms of their contract, then be free to live among the colonies or given land to farm on their own. They also could vote and were free to intermarry with the English colonists or whomever they pleased. In 1641, slavery became legal when a freed slave of African descent, Anthony Johnson, sued for the lifetime bondage of his former indentured servant who actually served out his contract and had gone to work for another family. This sparked the system of legal lifetime bondage for the colonists, and shortly after, laws began to spring up that placed free people of African descent down to a third class borderline slavery status. When these new slave laws, what would eventually come to be known as the slave codes, started to take root within the colonies, 
Calls for the abolishment of slavery or lifetime bondage began to grow louder and louder. When in 1819, we see the first anti-literacy law passed in Missouri, forbidding anyone to teach a slave to learn and read or write. Shortly after, in 1829, with the help of the African Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, an organization of black Freemasons, later to be called the Prince Hall Grand Lodge, a free abolitionist named David Walker wrote a publication entitled Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, which openly advocated slave rebellion. Quickly, we see the second anti-literacy law passed in Georgia. Then two years after that, we get the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion and even more anti-literacy laws passed. At the same time, you had many other slaves escaping and rebelling against their owners, which brought about a need to have someone that could keep them in line and track them down when they escaped. Enter the Slave Patrol. As stated, with the early colonies having no established or regulated police force in existence, many of the colonists had to participate themselves when the law needed to be enforced. This included joining the slave patrol when the law required it. Every free man in the town or country, regardless of race, had to join the slave patrol, also called patty rollers or patrollers, which is where the word patrol actually comes from. They were used to track down runaway slaves, to intimidate them and to keep them in line, or from becoming too unruly and rebellious. Also to break up slave gatherings, which were usually covers for planning uprisings, punishing slaves with no good reason for intimidation, and monitoring slave pass requirements for slaves traveling unaccompanied off of the plantations. Because of the uptick of runaway slaves at the time, slave owners required slaves to have travel passes when unsupervised off of the plantation. Yet another reason for not wanting slaves to learn how to read and write. So they could not forge these and other documents that gave them free passage or free status. However, in many cases, because the children of the plantation owners were friends with the slaves and their children, they taught them what they learned in school when it was time to play. Also, many slave owners wanted their slaves to read the Bible as well as keep the financial books to increase profits. So they ignored the anti-literacy laws, and in this way, a great number of slaves learned to read and write, and were able to forge some of the documents allowing them free passage. William M. Banks, professor of African American Studies at the University of Berkeley, states in his book, Black Intellectuals, literacy also threatened the control and surveillance networks for slaves in the South. Concern about runaways prompted slaveholders to require passes for all slaves traveling unaccompanied off the plantation. Literate slaves, however, could forge the necessary papers and escape to the north. Few white patrollers could read well enough to verify the documents. Many slaves who learned to read and write did indeed achieve freedom by this method." Unquote. Because these slaves learned the rules to the game or system, they were able to manipulate the system and earn freedom for themselves. As stated by William Banks, most slave patrollers were illiterate and very remedial readers at best. They couldn't verify whether the forged papers were legitimate or not. As well, slave patrollers knew very little to no law at all and were only policy enforcers, which is where the word police actually comes from. Police equals policy enforcement. These slave patrols grew more powerful as new slave codes increased demand for their services. Slave codes were the laws pertaining to slaves in regards to free people, what they could and could not do versus what a free person could do. Slaves, especially the highly melanated ones, were subject to questioning, searches, and other forms of harassment. Sound familiar? Whippings and beatings were the norm for the non-compliant slaves, sometimes even the compliant ones. The slave patrols were a major force for keeping slaves in line all the way up until the Civil War. After the Civil War, when slaves were freed, slave patrols, no longer having the backing of the law, reformed into different groups to maintain intimidation and control over the newly freed slaves. Most became security patrols to protect Caucasians against retaliation from the newly freed slaves. The two main groups that were formed after the slave patrols broke apart were the Ku Klux Klan and what we know today as the modern police force. The Klan became the main intimidation and suppression arm of white supremacy and the rich elite against these recently emancipated people. 
who under the Reconstruction Act were given equal rights with whites via the 14th and 15th Amendments. This greatly angered Southern whites who used the Ku Klux Klan to embark on a campaign of terror and intimidation to prevent these new citizens from exercising their rights to vote. This is where the word bulldozer comes from. The Klan and anyone else who was willing to jump in would administer a bull's dose of a beating to any blacks looking to vote after the 15th Amendment was passed. This is how Jim Crow was passed because after so many beatings, the Southern blacks were too scared to go and vote against it. When Jim Crow eventually did pass, the laws that were put in force against these lightly to highly melanated newly freed slaves were called the Black Codes, just a remix of the former slave codes that had been in place before the Civil War, which dealt with slaves in regards to free people. The Black Codes dealt with so-called black people in regards to so-called white people. At the same time, in the late 1800s to early 1900s, you had the boom of the Industrial Revolution, and many factories were being built in the different cities and states of the South, and needed workers to fill these factories. But the rich robber barons that owned the companies did not want to pay workers fair wages, and made them work under harsh conditions. Because of this, workers got unruly and needed to be handled. So many of the factory owners and municipalities began to hire former slave patrollers and private individuals as security for these factories and towns to maintain order and keep worker uprisings down. As factories and cities grew because of this industrial boom and the newly freed slaves looking for opportunity, the need for more security to maintain the burgeoning population became apparent. As more cities and businesses began investing in private security forces to keep the poor whites and blacks under control, these new security forces, many of them staffed by ex-slave patrollers and Klansmen, increased in number and size and became more organized. Then legislation was drafted to make them part of local governments to be funded by taxpayers until you get what we know today as the modern police force. As stated, the main purpose of these private security forces was the protection and security of property for the rich, as well as the enforcement of the Jim Crow policies upon the many blacks migrating to these new industrial towns after slavery. Protecting and serving the public at large was a distant fourth for these officers, unless you were one of the wealthy elite, because they were never created to protect the public, only the wealthy and their property. During the reconstruction period, the freed slaves gained a considerable amount of power within the government, having the same rights and privileges as Caucasian citizens and establishing a fledgling yet growing black middle class in white America. This exploding black middle class continued to grow and prosper all the way up into the 1920s because these new Jim Crow laws, for all of their bad intention, actually forced them to work together and keep money within their own communities. The lesser skilled Caucasian workforce saw these growing communities as a threat and another massive violent intimidation campaign by the Ku Klux Klan, now one of the most powerful organizations in America, was set into motion, beating, hanging, and terrorizing the majority of these communities into submission. These fear tactics, which included bulldozing or bulldozing, effectively stomped out the light of political activity, participation, and change in the eyes of the new free people. They no longer wanted anything to do with the law or government for fear of being beaten or hung. Many of their intimidation tactics, to a lesser degree, have persisted within these law enforcement organizations since their inception, and have kept this fear of law and government within these communities since the Jim Crow era, so they never rely on the law or government for political or social change, which is the only way you will actually get it. Learning the law in 2020 is the equivalent of slaves learning to read during legalized slavery. It allows one with the courage to seek the knowledge to free themselves. One such movement that was started based on law and organization was the Black Panthers. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was started by Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, two college student activists who wanted to stop police violence and racial oppression against black people in the community. Bobby Seale was a skilled organizer, and Huey Newton had gone to law school for six months and was familiar with constitutional law and well-versed in California gun laws. Their mission was to organize disciplined armed groups of men to watch over the police as they conducted police stops. 
Huey was well aware that California law permitted them to have loaded weapons in public as long as they weren't concealed. And they were allowed to observe the police executing police stops as long as they kept a certain distance according to California law. This simultaneously angered and scared the police as well as terrified Caucasian America. It became severely apparent to white America that they had to do something about this new movement when armed Black Panthers stormed the Capitol building in Sacramento because of new gun legislation being discussed against them. When they arrived on the front steps, they were swarmed by media and were instantly introduced along with their revolutionary mission statement to all of America. When they finally made their way to the assembly where the bill was being discussed, legislators out of fear of being shot dove under the desk. From that point on, the Black Panthers became America's number one priority, labeling them as terrorists behind the scenes so that law enforcement can use any means necessary to stop the threat publicly. This included J. Edgar Hoover's COINTELPRO counterintelligence program, designed to infiltrate the organization and cause strife and turmoil between the factions. This along with dueling philosophies and petty power struggles eventually brought the Black Panthers down. Though their movement was founded on sound law principles, the lack of continued education in the law by Huey Newton or the widespread education of it to the members of the Black Panther Party left them open to attack by a system they didn't fully understand. Surely an organization of that size, disciplined, dedicated, and passionate, being masters in the law, would have made them an undefeatable opponent to the establishment. Yet the melanated people of America's fire for social and political change was stomped out yet again by the system taking advantage of their ignorance and apathy for the law. This can truly be seen in the case of the Central Park Five. Five teenagers falsely accused and coerced into confessing to the rape of a 28-year-old Caucasian woman in Central Park. These five teenagers were rounded up for questioning by the NYPD in relation to the rape of the woman in Central Park. When they arrived at the police station, they were placed in separate rooms for interrogation without lawyers or parents. And before their parents arrived, the kids were told if they confessed to whatever happened, they would be able to go home later that evening. When their parents did arrive, they were told the same thing and thus allowed their children to be interrogated about the assault, again without lawyers present. And instead of asking general questions to ascertain if the kids did it or not, they were coerced into a confession taken into custody and convicted of a crime they didn't commit, then sentenced to seven to 14 years in prison. All because the children and parents did not know enough law to have a lawyer present or something as simple as just to remain silent. Had the children remained silent or had a lawyer present during questioning to tell them to remain silent and not answer questions, the Central Park Five would have gone home that evening because there was no evidence to tie them to the crime other than their coerced confessions. A quote from one of the mothers states, they used our lack of knowledge of the legal system against us. Angry Heart. just watching that little clip. Ava DuVernay's When They See Us has been called one of the most important and musty series of the year. It shined a light on the true story of five teens from Harlem falsely accused of attacking a jogger in Central Park in the spring of 1989. Well, join us now is Kevin Richardson, who was only 14 when accused of this crime. Kevin spent more than five years in juvenile detention. He was exonerated in 2002 and has dedicated his life to activism. He's joined by his attorney, Vanessa Plotkin. They both worked very closely at the Innocence Project. Uh, Kevin, you gave a false confession. Vanessa, how common are these? Well, since 1989, the year that Kevin was wrongfully arrested, 2,471 people have been proven innocent. Wow. And 365 of those cases were people proven innocent by DNA testing. You know, people who served decades in crimes, in prison for crimes they didn't commit. And in 28 percent of the DNA exoneration cases, Innocent people have falsely confessed to crimes that they didn't commit. How, False how, confessions but occur. But how does that happen? How do you how do you how do you admit to something you absolutely did not do? Well, because as soon as you are the interrogation begins, the goal of the interrogation is not, you know, for police to get more information about the crime. It's not an interview. The goal is to get you to confess. In this country, police can lie. 
right? They can lie about evidence. They can say, we have fingerprints, we have DNA. If you're innocent, because interrogations are so stressful, this leads innocent people to falsely confess, because they think if I just tell them what they want to hear, the interrogation will end, the investigation will continue when they do DNA testing. You know, when they examine the prints, they'll see it's not me and I'll be cleared. Mm. But of course, that doesn't happen. Police can also lie about consequences. You know, we saw this. This was what was so, you know, outrageous and almost just equated with child abuse in when they see us is that, you know, they can elude. Just tell us. You need to tell us now. But, you know, you want to go home, don't you? So they make people believe if they just, if you cooperate with the police, if you give them what they want to hear, you will be able to go home. So we need to change in this country how we conduct interrogations. You know, we need to change the culture of yeah. policing. We need to change, you know, how criminal investigations and prosecutions are conducted. Yeah. Kevin, tell us. Since allowing black people to integrate within their system, they have used those same people's discouragement, disinterest, and lack of knowledge of that system to oppress, control, intimidate, and terrify them into submission. Melanated or so-called black people make up 13% of the population of the United States, but make up only 4% of the American Bar Association, which means they are the most underrepresented people in the law by far. The most feared man in American history, believe it or not, is not Hitler, Stalin, Huey Newton, Martin Luther King, Louis Farrakhan, or even Malcolm X. The most feared man in American history was Johnny Cochran, a melanated brother who was the smartest lawyer in America and hell-bent on helping his people and raising them out of the downtrodden, racially oppressed situation America engineered them to be in. He had gotten famous people acquitted, such as Michael Jackson, Sean Puffy Combs, Snoop Dogg, Tupac Shakur, Tupac's godfather and high-ranking Black Panther member, Geronimo Pratt, for a murder he did not commit, got the highest police brutality settlement in New York history at $8.7 million, and won the most famous case of all, O.J. Simpson. Johnny Cochran was a master of the law and the American judicial system, and terrified prosecutors when they saw him coming. He was a major activist against police brutality and police corruption in general. This is the type of so-called black man that America feared the most, someone who masters the rules of the game and then is able to bend it to his will, especially in the face of police brutality and corruption. Police officers or patty rollers not only assume, but count on the fact that you don't know the law when they approach you. This allows them to lie more effectively, which police officers can legally and usually do. As stated in the video, their mission is to get you to incriminate yourself in illegal and many times illegal way they can to make their job much easier. Also, as unfortunate as the situation may have been, one of the positives of the Central Park Five tragedy was that it taught those five naive kids the magnitude, severity, and importance of knowing the law and your rights. Even though the desire, passion, motivation and enthusiasm for learning the law has been driven and beaten out of the melanated people of America and the world, it is the very pinnacle of what you must learn today. All countries, governments and systems in the world are run by some type of laws or rules to the game. And unless you had a hand in writing those rules, you are a slave to them until you can learn them well enough to manipulate the law to your advantage. Huey Newton overstood this to a very small degree and was still able to create a movement that touched the world using very elementary principles of law. Imagine if he took it seriously enough to require all of the Black Panthers to know it, or at least enough to where every melanated person in the community, young and old, was able to handle themselves with officers at a police stop. Being able to know when a police officer is lying about the law in order to harass and profile a citizen, like our hero to the hood, Mr. Toy Battle. You shouldn't even give them no information. That's illegal. This illegal search. Somebody else stopped you today. Don't worry. No, he ain't got to answer no questions. He ain't got to answer no questions. It's no matter. It ain't on though right now. You didn't press the button. I know law, bro. If you ain't committing no crime, you ain't got no business right here asking no question, interrogating them. This is a legal detain. What crime was committed? Who would they say was watching? Who they said that did it? Who are you looking for? What's the person's name? What's the description of the person, officer? What's your badge number? What's your badge number? Rosenbaum, 161. 161? Okay. I'll be calling your office. They know who I am, Toy Battle. 
This is a legal search. You ain't supposed to do none of this. This is a legal stop, too. You have suspicion? I'm not, I'm not stopping. You have suspicion? But you ain't supposed to ask that, though, because you're running them right now in Leeds. You're free to go right Yeah, you is free to go. He is free to go. He always free to go. And don't ask nobody else on Howard their name without them committing crimes. That is illegal. Y'all time is almost up. All right? Don't ask nobody their name and their ID. That's illegal. Yeah, everybody always good out here. We only good when you ain't out here manipulating people. Have a nice day. Stop scanning people's names. Find some real criminals. Because next time it might cost you your badge. Yeah, for real. You know what the ultra-various law is? Stop breaking the law. Now, as you can see from this video and many others, bad police officers will lie much of the time in order to harass or engage the poor and sometimes not so poor melanated citizens of the community. But you also can see how knowing the law and your rights can protect you from that type of harassment from police officers who know mostly procedure and very little law themselves. Nine out of 10 times they assume you don't know the law and look to them to be the authority of it. Which is why many times they will falsely charge you with an infraction just to justify the engagement or harassment. Now here are the most common charges used against citizens to justify harassment. Pedestrian violations. Vagrancy, just hanging around and doing nothing. Disorderly conduct, most of the time talking loudly to police. Loitering, which again is just hanging around. Disturbing the peace, which most of the time would be yelling at the police or yelling in public. Jaywalking, littering, and domestic disputes. Some traffic violations. Broken taillight, changing lanes without signaling, speeding, an expired registration, no front or rear license plate, no seat belt, tinted windows, muffler too loud, music too loud, and swearing at a police officer. These are the most common laws or infractions used to justify harassment, profiling, excessive force, unlawful searches and seizures, and brutality against citizens. It is up to you to arm yourselves with the knowledge to protect you and your family against these injustices. Collectively learning the law is the one and only last remedy that so-called black people have yet to explore to its fullest extent. You guys keep dancing around it like Sammy Davis and Gregory Hines, while the government and law enforcement is Chris Brown and Stomp the Yard. One example of this would be the legal definition of the word black, which is why I keep saying so-called black people. Black is technically thought to be a color, and the legal definition of color is an appearance as distinguished from that which is real, an apparent right, or deceptive appearance. The word also means the dark color of the skin showing the presence of Negro blood, and hence is equivalent to African descent or parentage. The legal definition of Negro is a black man, one descended from the African race, and does not commonly include a mulatto. The term Negro also means necessarily a person of color, but not every person of color is a Negro. So as you can see from this legal definition, Negro means a black man descended from the African race. However, there is no definition for the term black man, which places you right back under color, that which is not real or something having a deceptive appearance which says to the law, we can do anything we want to this person or thing because they legally do not exist under this status. All the while you just think you're referring to yourself by a color, which in itself is a misconception and error because people are the object, not the color of the object. The law sees this as a deception, being that it understands the same simple principles of science regarding color. This fake status and color, specifically the color black, which etymologically means pale or yellow, not dark, was intentionally placed and promoted upon melanated people in order to give them a false sense of equality in a system built to enslave and subjugate them, and at the very most treat them as second class and third class citizens. This is because 80% of the so-called black people in America are actually aboriginals or descendants of aboriginal Americans, whom you call Native Americans, and are heirs, heiresses, and beneficiaries to most of the land in North America, and having them collectively know that would be the destruction of the United States Corporation. This is how the people of Tulsa, Oklahoma's Black Wall Street got the land to build on. 
This so-called Black Wall Street was actually built on Indian territory by melanated people who applied for the land as Native Americans under the Dawes Act, a program set up by the U.S. government to distribute Native American lands to individuals of Native American heritage or descent. Because these people did not legally classify themselves as colored, Negroes, black, or descendants of slaves, and could show a connection to an aboriginal nation or tribe, they were eligible for the distribution of this land. Many Caucasians were able to pay the government $5 to be artificially placed on the list, which is where you get the term $5 Indian. For more on this information, go see my video, 40 Acres and a Fool. But this is just one example of the word trickery that is used in law, also known as legalese. Words you think mean one thing on the street mean a completely opposite or unrelated thing in the legal system. A simpler example of this word trickery would be the word driver. To the average person, the word driver means someone who operates a vehicle on the highway or street. However, the legal definition of a driver is someone who is paid to take another back and forth along the highway. And incidentally, the legal definition of passenger is someone who pays another to take them back and forth along the highway. So technically, unless you're getting paid to operate a vehicle on the highway, you're only traveling and not driving and should not need a driver's license, which is technically the same as a business license or a tax. Not to be confused with a certificate of proficiency that shows you're competent in whatever subject the certificate is for, and in this case would be operating a motor vehicle. The true purpose of this legal system and every other legal system in the world has continued from the ancient systems, and that is to tax citizens for violations of the law in order to generate money for the municipalities and the people who run those municipalities. Justice, fairness, equity, and protection of rights are a distant second and last place third to how much money can be generated for the system based on your ignorance and violation of the law. No one suffers from the brutal consequences of the ignorance of law more than so-called black people. We complain and cry the most about the brutality and atrocities committed against us by the patty rollers or police officers or being railroaded and taken advantage of in court, yet fail to teach ourselves and our youths the basic principles we need to know in order to move around freely in a system designed to defeat us. There are no basic law workshops within our communities and schools to teach us how to protect ourselves against bad police officers and public officials abusing the law what laws to know when a police officer approaches you, how to spot when a police officer is lying in order to harass you, what to do when a police officer violates your rights, how not to speak to a police officer or representative of the law when you're not sure about the situation, as with the Central Park Five, who all would have gone home within hours had they known just that simple law, or if the parents had known the one true legal remedy that terrifies all police officers, which is placing a commercial lien on that officer's police insurance, also known as their official surety bond, something the law requires every police officer to have in case they violate a citizen's rights or causes damage to the public at large. No police officer can work without this bond or if its assets are in question. For more information on this, please see my video on the Know Your Rights Cards and Manual. Link available in the description box below. Big shout out to Colin Kaepernick, who has the closest thing to these workshops with his Know Your Rights camps. However, they are only one day and recently have only come one per year. They are largely sponsored by Nike and are more of an event than an actual class and study in being proficient in knowing your rights. This information and knowledge needs to be drilled into adults and children like social studies and math in an organized control environment they feel comfortable in and aren't afraid of being taken advantage of or made fun of for being ignorant of the basic principles of law. This is the real future the racist controllers of a racist system are afraid of. Not you picking up guns and invading their homes, but you picking up law books and unifying into a body politic where individually and collectively you are masters of the system and laws or rules they've created to defeat and destroy you. Arming yourselves with the principles, procedures, and remedies of the law instead of emotional rhetorical marches and rallies for change. 
Getting on stage or in front of an iPhone and screaming and crying about the problems, begging for help and handouts from a system created to oppress you won't change anything. Only learning, mastering, and manipulating the rules to the Monopoly game will get you boardwalk and park place. And if your kung fu is good enough, even get you a get out of jail free card. Hey everybody, I'd like to thank you guys for supporting my channel and this highly important information that people need to hear. If you're not a subscriber, go ahead and press that subscribe button now so that you can get the information when I put out a video. Also, for people interested in learning status law, basically how to change your title from black to Aboriginal American, you can just subscribe to my Patreon channel where status classes are uploaded there or you can purchase the classes on my website at realnagas.com and the Naga Knowledge Shop. If you purchase a hard copy melanin book, you will get the constitutional rights card package for free. That's the card and the Know Your Rights Manual. For those interested in learning just basic police stop law, I will be starting a police stop law class in mid-January for my $20 level and above Patreon subscribers. Anyone who subscribes at the $50 level and above will get access to both classes plus your choice of a free digital copy of the Great Book of Melanin Research or a free constitutional rights card package. Once again, I want to thank you guys for supporting the information and my channel and may your kung fu be invincible.